So this morning, I want to share a message that I shared at Come Rest on Thursday night about the simplicity of following God. Now, Rob's already heard this message, so God's trying to really tell you that you need to focus in on him. He's given you a double do dose. Um, but normally, we would be in the book of Luke. Um, but after sharing this message, I got some encouragement that it needed to be shared again. Um, and I began praying about it. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to share this, especially because a large part of the message has to do with a testimony about our new church building. And I thought it would be fruitful and productive to encourage the church about the testimony of the new church building before we move in. And so I wanted to share this message about the simplicity of following God. It comes from Joshua 3 and John 10, 27. Lord, I pray that you would bless this message. Father, help us to listen to you, to obey you. Father, to hear your word today, to hear what's being shared. Let it be from you and not from me. Be glorified in this message. Help us to grow closer to you as we learn about the simplicity of following you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Joshua 3. I'm going to read the entire chapter of Joshua 3, so bear with me. And then we're going to talk about um, what it means and what's going on. Joshua Chapter 3, starting at verse 1, I'm reading out of the ESV. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Amen. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass it before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I am with you. Verse 8. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come, hear and listen the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know the living God is among you. Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that without fail he will drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. All right, also the Gigabytes and the Megabytes. Okay, driving all the ites out. Verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you in the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord when, uh, of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan will be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand together in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and, soon as those, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away. At Adam, the city beside Zarethan, and those flowing down towards the Sea of Arabia, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all of Israel was passing over on dry ground until the nations finished passing over the Jordan. So I want to set some context for what we just read. Because it's super important and it's super powerful when we learn the lesson from Joshua 3 that I believe God's trying to teach. The context is this. Moses had led the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, out of captivity from Egypt. So Israel has left Egypt. They've wandered the desert for 40 years. Moses has now died. Joshua is now leading the way. Joshua now has the job of leading this new generation of Israelites into the promised land. Because the first generation didn't listen to God. They didn't follow God, and so they had to wander the desert for the new generation to rise up. 
so that they might go into, this, into the promised land. And what I want you to understand is how many people there were. There was a, a, uh, a census right before this in, in this book of Joshua, in the end of the book of Numbers, they're, they're counting the people. They're having the census before they enter into the promised land. And the census found that there were 600,000 men of fighting age. That's all they counted because that's what they cared about was who can go to war, right? So they got 600,000 men of fighting age. So knowing that plus women and children and men not of fighting age, the people of Israel wandering the desert probably were around 2 million people. So we've got Joshua and these 2 million people, and Joshua has the task of leading 2 million people into the promised land. I want you all to think about how much of a logistical nightmare that is. How complicated it would be to lead 2 million people into the promised land with all of their things, with all of their, with, with their families and their tents and, and their treasure that they, that they plundered. All of these things that they have to now go into the promised land. It's a logistical nightmare. I freak out trying to move this church of like 50 people downtown and, and Joshua's got to move a, 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 a nation of 2 million people into a promised land. Not only that, they've got to cross this raging river. 2 million people have to cross a raging river, Jordan. Then they have to go into occupied enemy territory. That's what all the ites are about. Because there's these enemies who have occupied the promised land and, and God's saying go and take the promised land and they've got to go up against these enemies, drive out the Canaanites and the, Je and the Jebusites and all of the other ites and they've got to be protected so that they can dwell in the promised land. By man's standards, that would be a very difficult thing for one guy to accomplish. For one guy leading two million people. You guys following me so far? Like can you, if you've ever led a group of any amount of people, you can understand how frustrating it can be to try to lead people. And, and, and Moses found that out. I mean, most of Moses' story was him just banging his head up against the people of Israel because he's trying to follow God. And so there's this very complicated thing. But the message today is that following God is simple. God did not tell Joshua, I want you to figure this out on your own. God didn't say, Joshua, you've got the promised land and two million people, figure it out and go do it. God said, I'm going to go before you and I want you to follow me. So he talks about the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what the Ark of the Covenant is, the Ark of the Covenant is, is very simply, I don't, I don't say it simplified to demean what it is, but just for simplicity's sake, it's, it's a box, a very holy and ornate box that God's presence would choose to be in so that he could be around the people of Israel. At this time, there was no temple for God to dwell in, so he dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant, and so he would be in, in his nation, in the nation of Israel. So when you read the Ark of the Covenant move before them and follow the Ark of the Covenant, what God is saying is, I'm going to move out before you, and I want you to follow me. It's very simple. It's a very simple, and I, I think it really can be boiled down to two steps, y'all. I think following God can be boiled down to two steps. One, watch where God is going. Two, follow God. Really simple. Two steps. Watch where God is going. Two, follow God. So let's talk about that first step here. Step one, watch where God is going. Look at verses three and four, and, and I want to show you what they say. And, and Joshua commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that is God, as soon as you see God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length. Now, 2,000 cubits in length, rough estimate, would be about 1,000 yards, 10 football fields. A cubit is, a, is, is about two yards in length. The rough estimate, I mean, it, it, it varies depending on civilization and time and history, but about a yard. So uh, when he says 2,000 um, two cubits, we're talking about 10 football fields, about uh, 1,000 yards. He says, once the ark is 1,000 yards in front of you, that's when I want you to go. Don't start right away. Don't, don't follow next to me. I want you to watch where I'm going and follow. Now, if you come to Wednesday night service, I like to do this thing in Wednesday night service when we're reading scripture, and I like to ask a question that is answered in the text, and then see who's paying attention to the text, because a lot of times I'll ask a question that's answered directly in the text, and then people will have these really long convoluted answers, and I'm like, yeah, that's great, but if you just read the next verse, that's the answer. The question here is why? 
Why did God say, I want, you, I want to be a thousand yards in front of you before you follow me? Why would God do that? Now, we could give this long 30-minute theological answer about why God needs to be a thousand yards in front, but the text tells us exactly why. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits. Do not come near it. Why? That's what this in order is. That, that means because. Because of this reason. Here's why. Why shouldn't you come near it? Because you've not gone this way before. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go, for you have not gone this way before. Amen. The answer is right in Scripture. God wants to show us the way. And he wants us to watch him do it before we start walking. I think that if we were up next to God in this scenario and we're standing next to him, we've never been this way before. We've never been to the promised land. We're going for the first time this generation. And God's saying, you've never been this way before. If we're up next to the, to the Ark of the Covenant, we might look forward and see something and say, well, let's go right instead of left. And God says, no, 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 we need to go left. Ah, oh, God, I, the left is kind of dark and scary. Let's go right. That's a big valley. Let's go over here to this nice place. We might look ahead and say, I think it would be better if we go this way or that way. God doesn't want to argue with us about which way to go. God doesn't want to have to convince us about which way to go. God simply wants us to follow him. It takes out any kind of guesswork. There is no burden on us to figure out which way we're supposed to go when we're following God. And he says, let me go a thousand yards in front of you. Then there's no question. When he's a thousand yards, we watch. Is he going to go left? Is he going to go right? Is he going to go straight? Is he going to go through the valley? Is he going to go around the valley? What's he going to do? If we do step one right, watch where God is going, then step two becomes very easy. Step one, watch where God is going. Step two, go the way that God goes. Follow him. I watch God go right around that valley, so I'm going to go right around that valley. I watch God approach those trees and then go to the left. So I'm going to approach those trees and go to the left. I watch God approach the, the city of Canaan from the east side. So that's the side that I'm going to go. It's very, very simple. I'm just following. Some, can, I, can I tell you all a pet peeve? Some of you all are offenders on this pet peeve. So I, I apologize if I'm going to offend you. Okay, we live in the age of 2017. Nearly everybody who drives has a GPS on their phone. When you tell me how to get to your house, with the exception of the Davidsons who breaks the GPS, when you tell me how to get to your house, all I want to know is your address. Amen. Okay? I don't need to know about turning left at the old Dairy Queen that used to be a Piggly Wiggly or whatever. Okay? I, don't need to, I don't need to know about any of that stuff. Just give me your address, please. That's all I want. Because when you tell me all of these things, I'm going to get confused. I'm going to get lost. My, my parents are from Oklahoma, and all of their roads go north to south and east to west. They don't even say left or right when they give directions. They're like, turn east on third, then turn north on J. And I'm like, I don't know which way east or north is. What are you talking about? It's complicated when you put all these directions. But when I have a GPS, it's very easy. Turn left. Turn right. You missed it, stupid. Turn around. Go again. Right? It's, it's so easy. It's very, very simple. There's no complication there. I'm sorry if y'all are direction givers. I still love you. Just get with it. GPS. Okay. All right. Watch where God is going. Go the way that he goes. Think about how simple that is for two million people. Two million people, there's a lot of logistics, but if every man says, all I'm going to do is I'm going to watch where God's going and I'm going to follow, then it's very simple. I'm going to take my tent, I'm going to take my things and my family, and we're going to go the way that God goes. And everybody else does that, it works. We don't have to do organized raiding parties or scouts or anything like that because we're just following God. It takes all of the logistics, it takes all of the complications out of it. So the two-step process... Watch where God is going, and then follow God. But God loves us so much, he gives us a third bonus step. There's a bonus step, because God loves us so much, he gives us this little extra. It's not even needed, but he loves us enough, he's got so much mercy, there's this bonus step. The bonus step is watch for miraculous confirmation. Yeah. Watch for miraculous confirmation. God says, watch where I'm going. 
Give me a thousand yards and then watch where I'm going, then follow me. And he says, by the way, just so you know that it is truly God who is among you, it is truly God who is leading you, I'm going to stop up the rivers of the Jordan. Look at these verses here. Joshua 3, 10 through 13. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will let, without fail drive, bef drive out before you all of the Canaanites and all the other ites. Verse 11, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off and they will gather gather together in a giant heap. I want you to picture this, okay? It's not like the river dried up. It's not like it was hot and the river dried up because people might be able to explain that. You might be able to explain that away. Well, it's just a drought and that was fortunate. No, no, no. They, they stopped up like a giant massive wall. All of the water that was coming just stopped in one spot like there was an invisible barrier and it was just hitting this giant barrier. It would have been a crazy sight to see. It was miraculous. And again, the answer for why God did that is in the text. God did not do that to make it easier for the Israelites to cross the Jordan. That's not what the text says. I'm sure that helped. It was nice that they didn't have to walk through the river, but that's not why God did it. Look again at, at, at verse 10. Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you. That's why God did it. God did it because he loved the Israelites so much that he was willing to miraculously confirm that they were going the right way. Maybe the Israelites struggled with faith. I know we all struggle with faith sometimes. Maybe they were getting ready to go to the land and they've got these Canaanites and Jebusites and Hivites and all of these ites and they're thinking, man, are we going to be able to take this land or are these guys going to kill us all? And God loves them so much that he meets them in their weakness and he says, look, I'm going to prove to you that you're going the right way and that I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give you miraculous, merciful confirmation that you're going the right way. So three steps in following God. Very simple. Watch where God's going. Follow the way that he's going. Watch for miraculous confirmation. Amen. Now, of course, we know the, the end of the story, right? The end of the story is... Um, of course, God does stop up the river. The people go through. They get to Jericho. God tells them some crazy things to do at Jericho, marching around the walls. The walls come down. They, they come and they enter the land and they divide it and they take the land. And by following God, everything worked out for the Israelites. It wasn't perfect. They didn't perfectly follow God because uh, none of us perfectly uh, do what we're supposed to do when we probably won't until we're in heaven. But there was so much mercy and grace with following God. And so the end of the story is the two million people inhabited the land just like God said they would. So I want to talk about us as Christians today. We're not two million Israelites wandering the desert. We're Christians, followers of Christ Jesus in modern day America, meeting in an old school building, getting ready to go and meet in a downtown office building. What does this look like for us? I think God does the same for us that he did for Joshua and the Israelites. I think everything looks the same except for one small thing. The only difference between our story, our lives, and their story, the story of Joshua, is that we don't have the Ark of the Covenant. We've got something much better. We have the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let me explain what I'm talking about. The Ark of the Covenant was a, was a physical vessel made of gold and wood and all these ornate things that carried the living spirit of God. It was a physical vessel that carries the living spirit of God. But Jesus said, once I die and rise again, if you've been born again, then God's holy living spirit is going to come and live in you. God traded in a physical vessel for a living vessel. We have become like Arks of the Covenant ourselves in that we are carrying the spirit of the living God. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells within you? When you are born again, you become a living Ark of the Covenant, a living temple for God to dwell in. So the two-step process changes just very slightly. 
And I want to share this with you so that you know very clearly because we can't simply watch a wooden box go left and right. That, would, that, that seems like that would be a lot easier, but God's got a better plan for us. So our two-step process changes slightly. Before, it was watch where God is going, follow God, bonus step, God miraculously confirms. Now, it's just slightly different. Now it is listen to God. Step one, listen to God. Step two, follow God. Step three, miraculous confirmation. We now watch God and where he is going, not with physical eyes like the Israelites did, but we have the spirit of God living inside of us and he speaks to us and he tells us where to go. So instead of watching the Ark of the Covenant move, we are now faithfully listening to God and we are obeying the way that he tells us that we should go and he miraculously confirms that we're on the right path as he does it. This two-step process is very simply laid out in John chapter 10, verse 27. And I want to say, I say two-step process a little bit tongue-in-cheek. I'm simplifying things. I don't mean to put God in a box or say he has to operate this way or anything like that. It's just to simplify the process. There are other ways in which God moves, of course. But I believe that, that the main way that God moves is that he speaks to us, we listen, and then we follow. John 10, 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. There's that two-step process. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Now, I want to address anybody here who might find it difficult to listen to God. Because we're a young church, and there's a lot of people in here who were saved in this church or, or, or really came to know a relationship with Jesus in this church. Um, and I know personally that I, uh, as a pastor, one of the number one questions or complaints that I get as a pastor is, well, pastor, you seem to be able to hear from God a lot, but I don't ever hear from him. Or I find it difficult to listen. Or what am I doing wrong? Or what do I need to do to hear God like you hear God? So I want to address that. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. I think there's two major ways in which God speaks to people. And when I say speak, I mean speak with words. I think there's two major ways that God speaks to people. The first is through whispers, and the second is loud and booming. You guys remember the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19? I'm sure that many of you do. It's a very popular story. The gist of it is this. Elijah was a very powerful prophet, and God spoke to him a lot, and he would go and he would speak out these prophecies. And at this point in Elijah's life, he is so frustrated because it seems like he's the only person following God on all the face of the earth. And he gets so frustrated, and he's like, God, they're even trying to kill me. Now they've, they've killed all your other prophets. Now they're trying to kill me. He's frustrated, and he's depressed. Because Elijah was a person, and he had problems, and he had faith issues. And so he was scared, and he was angry, and he was a little depressed. And so he went into a dark cave to hide and to try to sort things out. And then this happens. God comes down to Elijah and he says, Elijah, why are you here? And, God, and Elijah says, well, I've got to be the last person following you. And they're trying to kill me, Lord. And, and I don't know what's going on. And God says, I want you to meet me outside the cave. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 12. And he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks before the Lord, and, and, uh, but the Lord was not in the wind. So there's this great and mighty wind that even shook the mountain, and the rocks came crumbling down, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now look at this. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. I think the most common translation that's quoted is the still, small voice. God came in a still, small voice, a low whisper. And you know what God said when he whispered? He said the exact same thing to Elijah as he said when Elijah was in that cave. Same thing. Elijah, why are you here? And of course, this, this started a conversation that brought Elijah out of the cave and God showed him that there was in fact thousands of other godly people in Israel just waiting for him to rise up and that he was deceived in his depression. And God spoke to him and began leading him. Now the second way God speaks is through kind of a loud and booming audible voice, the kind of voice that seems to make everything stay still until God is done saying what he needs to say to you. 
It's similar to the voice we see in Matthew chapter 3, 16 through 17, when Jesus is being baptized. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw a spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Look at verse 17. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. A voice from heaven coming down, speaking audibly so you can hear it. It stops everything, and everybody just knows that it's God speaking. It's this loud and booming, audible voice of God coming down from heaven. Now, of these two types of voices, I think people who struggle most are people who are seeking after that second kind of voice. They're trying to hear that voice from heaven, that loud, booming, crazy, audible voice of God. And I want to tell you two things about that. First of all, it's very rare. The loud, booming voice from heaven is very rare. I've only heard it once, maybe twice in my life. Once for sure. I heard the loud, booming, audible, everything stopped voice from God. Many people, including Christians who are much holier, much smarter, much more well-versed than me, have gone their whole life never hearing that. And, and that's okay, because it's a rare thing. Here's the other thing I want to say, is that the loud, audible, booming voice of God is not something that you should seek after. Because this is the voice that God wants to stop everything regardless of where you're at, what you're doing, how life is going, because he's seeking after you with this voice. This is not one that we seek after him for. This is one where he comes down and seeks after you to get a very important thing said and accomplished. And so what I think happens is that Christians go seeking after this loud, booming voice of God, and they end up missing the very common whisper. They miss that whisper. They're so looking for God in the wind, in the earthquake, in the fire, in the thunder, that they miss God in the whisper. So let's talk about hearing that whisper. If you're a Christian, I believe God's whispering to you. I believe that he is. If you are born again, if you are saved, I believe God is whispering to you. The problem is not, how do I get God to speak to me? Because I truly believe that he already is. The question should be, why am I not hearing? Why am I not hearing what God is speaking? Maybe it's because you're not listening. Maybe it's because you don't know what to listen to. Or maybe it's because there is so much noise and chaos and craziness that it's overwhelming and it's difficult to hear that low, quiet whisper. If there's too much noise in your life, if life is too crazy and chaotic, and the only time you have to pray is before meals, right? by the way, if you are praying, like nothing tells me about your spiritual life and the way you pray before meals. People are praying for everything under the sun, and I'm like, y'all, there are other times in the day to pray before you, instead of before you eat. It's okay. You don't have to pray about great-grandma Gertrude's foot fungus right now. I just want to eat. If the only time you have to pray is before meals, then of course you're going to find it difficult to hear God. If this is you, then you need to find time. You need to make time to get quiet and peaceful before the Lord. To read your Bible, to pray, to seek his face. Put on some Christian music, but I want to encourage you, if you've never heard the voice of God, then don't put on anything with words because you don't want any kind of distraction. Maybe just a little bit of light piano music in the background if you need it. Otherwise, just be silent. Be still. If you've never heard the voice of God and you think it's because life's too crazy, make time to get quiet before the Lord. Pray something very, very simple. Lord, I'm giving you this time. I want to be peaceful before you. Would you begin to speak to me? And then listen. Now, if your problem is, is that you're not listening, then that's easy to fix too. Just shut up. That's it. If that's your problem, if your problem is that you're not listening, then shut up. And, and, and I say that tongue in cheek, but it's true. Sometimes we just need to stop. And, and oftentimes, we're, we want God to say something, and so we only listen to this one thing. I want God to say that we're going to have a million dollars by the end of the year. So if anything else is said, I'm not going to listen to that. And I'm just going to pray, Lord, give me a million dollars. Why don't I have a million dollars? Where's this million dollars? And God's trying to speak, and he's trying to say, son, you don't need a million dollars. I've got you covered, but I'm not wanting to hear that. And so I'm just pushing in on this prayer, and I'm not even giving God a chance to say anything. If that's your problem, just simply find a place, pray Lord, I'm sorry that I haven't been listening to you. 
would you speak and then get quiet and just wait. Wait upon the Lord. What's God whispering to you? Now, maybe there's a third struggle that people have is that they hear a lot of voices. But which one is God? Maybe what I'm hearing, maybe this whisper is my flesh. Maybe that's my unconsciousness. Maybe that's my imagination. Maybe what I'm hearing is something demonic that's trying to convince me to go elsewhere. Maybe I'm just crazy and I'm hearing voices. Which voice is the voice of God? How am I supposed to listen? Now, if that is you, I want to encourage you in this. Anyone ever lost their phone and lost all their contacts? Has that ever happened to anyone? Happens, right? Right? Um, especially before contacts were synced in the cloud. Like, you lose your phone. It was a big deal. Yeah. And when someone would call you, if you're like me, you don't have anybody's phone number memorized because you're so dependent on your cell phone, which is a problem, I admit. I have no idea what my wife's phone number is. Um, but it's, it's an issue, okay? I know what my phone number was when I was 10 years old and had a landline, but I don't know what my wife's phone number is now. Uh, when someone calls you in that situation, and, and you look at the number and you say, okay, it's 319, so it's someone in Iowa. And you answer the phone and they expect you to have read the caller ID and they just start talking to you. One of two things is going to happen. You're either going to say, hey, I'm so sorry, I lost my phone. I don't, I don't know whose number this is. Who is this? Or you're going to know that person so well that you recognize their voice and, and the way that they talk and the way that they joke that just the second they start talking, the second they greet you, you just instantly recognize, oh, that's my friend Zion. He's calling me to talk about video games and construction and discipleship. And I know I don't need to pull out his, my phone to figure that out. There's those two kinds of people. It's even a little bit embarrassing when you have to ask someone, who is this? Because what you're doing is you're admitting, I don't know you well enough to recognize your voice. If you're struggling to hear, to know which voice is the voice of God, I would say the odds are that you're not spending enough time with him that you know his character, that you know the way that he talks, that you know how he talks and the kinds of things that he talks about. And if that's you, if you've never heard the voice of God and you're saying, well, how am I supposed to get acquainted with him? Then please listen to the written word of God. He wrote it down for us to make it simple. He gave us 66 love letters. Find a way to listen to the word of God. Don't like reading? Okay, get, a, get, a, get an audio Bible. Find time. Instead of listening to the radio on the way to work, listen to scripture. Do something to get in the word of God. And what you'll find is you'll begin to learn exactly how God speaks. And then when you start hearing voices, you could say, no, 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 that doesn't line up with scripture at all. It doesn't line up with what I've heard at all. Right. Now there's this extra thing that I wanna encourage everybody here. Is that first of all, none of y'all are alone unless, unless Saul of Tarsus is in this congregation and he got converted by God coming down and showing himself. Unless we have convergence stories like that, and that does happen, I don't mean to diss on that, but most of us went through a time, short or long, where we got saved but didn't hear the voice of God or struggled to know what was the voice of God and what wasn't. So you're not alone in your struggle, okay? Don't, don't feel like you're the only person who struggles with not being able to hear God or discerning his voice. I, that, that's a lie from the devil. The devil wants you to think that you're alone and you're not. But the second thing is, is that there are so many Christians here who do listen to God and they want to help you and encourage you. Here's the beautiful thing. We all serve the same God, okay? We all serve the same God. I don't have a personal God. You don't have a personal God. We all serve the same God. He knows what God is saying to Shauna. He knows he's saying that to her. And if God wants to say something to me, he could say the same thing to me that he says to Shauna. And so maybe God is telling Shauna, I want you to marry a guy in Sierra Leone and he's going to have struggles with visas for years. And maybe she's struggling. Is this really the voice of God? What Shauna can do is she can go to other brothers and sisters in Christ and say, you know what? I think that God is telling me to marry this man in Sierra Leone. And you know what? They can pray and they hear from the same God. And God's not going to play tricks and tell one person one thing and one person the other. And they're all going to say, you know what? God told me the same thing. God says he wants you to marry that person. God says he wants you to, to, to chase after this mysterious Pastor Moses guy. And he could confirm that. And you know what's really awesome is there's still this step of miraculous confirmation. That step of miraculous confirmation doesn't go away. And the, and the, the, the most common way that I see it is when I go to other brothers or sisters in Christ and say, I believe God is speaking this. And then they'll be like, 
bro, I just had a dream about that. Right. Or they'll say, dude, I was just reading in scripture and that's exactly what I read this morning. Or God told me you were going to come and ask that and this is what he said to do. That is miraculous confirmation. So if you're struggling to listen to God, just talk with another believer who hears and say, I think God is saying this. And they'll either confirm that or they'll de deny it. And as you begin to grow in that, you'll begin to become more and more and more comfortable in hearing those whispers, hearing those still, those small, those quiet whispers. I hear those whispers every day. Many times they're questions like Elijah had. Many times the question, Christian, what are you doing here? And that just blows my mind because God knows that I needed that question. Other times it's instruction. Christian, you don't need to eat a pizza ranch today. You're getting kind of fat. Go on a fast. Okay? <laughs> Things like, it happens. God says all sorts of stuff. And, and when you begin to listen to him, your relationship grows and you are able to follow him. And then the only step that you have after that is to obey. And here's, here's the thing. It's really simple. Once you're good at listening to God, just do what he says. That's it. Don't think about it. Don't pull out your checkbook and find out and balance the sheet and say, is this really what he wants? Just listen. And remember, there's that miraculous confirmation. Okay, don't ignore that part. If you're not seeing miraculous confirmation, then maybe it's time to step back and say, is this really what God is saying? But when you're seeing that miraculous confirmation, then just listen. When Amanda and I were in Seattle, I've told this testimony before, but it's been a while. We were in Seattle. I was a systems analyst making more money than a newlywed ought to be making. We had a fantastic townhouse. Like, things were looking up. We were finally, for the first time in our lives, not living paycheck to paycheck. We had money in the bank. We were looking at Roth IRAs and 401ks, and we're like, in our early 20s and God is just whoo and then this guy comes into town and he says I want you to come to Singapore and live there for a year and then go on missions and Amanda and I didn't like the dude didn't like his theology didn't really like his church and we were like you know you say the Christian thing like right? I'll pray about it brother <laughs> right the Christian thing and I'll pray about it but Amanda and I aren't liars when we say we're going to pray about something we pray about it we always make sure. So he says, okay, why don't you pray about it, and then we'll have lunch in a week, and you tell me what God said. So a man and I don't even talk about it. And then like, I get a little alert on my phone. Hey, you're supposed to have, you're supposed to have lunch uh, about this meeting. So I'm like, all right, all right, we're going to go and have lunch. And I remember we're driving, and, and I, I, there was something very weird that happened, and I'll share this. Amanda was fasting that day. And she was fasting about something completely different, and she ate a banana on accident, and she actually vomited on the way to this guy. Like, God was like, no, you need to be fasting. And right after that happened, I go, hey, did you pray about what we're doing? And she goes, yeah. Did, did you pray about whether we're supposed to go? And I was like, yeah. And I go, what did God tell you? She was like, what did God tell you? And I'm like, I think God wants us to do it. And she was like, that's what God told me too. And we looked at each other, and we were like, okay. So we drove. We didn't talk about it. We didn't discuss what it looked like. We didn't think, oh, man, I'm giving up this fantastic career or anything like that. We just said, okay. God told both of us. We both feel at peace. He told us both individually. It was something we didn't want. By the way, if God's telling you to do something you don't want to do, it's almost certainly him. And the difficult part is when God's telling you to do something you want to do. That's when I struggle. When God's like, I want you to do this, I'm like, are you sure? Because I want to do that. Are you sure that's not me? But we didn't want to do it, so it was really easy. So we go and we say yes, and we didn't think about anything. If I would have known the complexities and the struggles and the challenges that we were facing, it would have been a much harder decision. But God didn't want that from me. He just wanted me to listen and to follow. One step at a time. I, re I remember I had to go and tell my job. I had just gotten a fantastic promotion. I now had people under me. I'm, a, I'm like 23, and I've got like four 40-year-old people under me, and, and I'm their boss, and, and I'm just like, uh, th things are going crazy. And I remember I have to go and tell my boss, who just gave me this promotion, that I'm going to quit. This is what God does when you listen to him. Okay, I went in to tell the guy I was going to quit, and I said, hey, Brandon, I need to talk to you, bro. And he said, oh, I actually need to talk to you, too. Perfect. Let's go into the conference room. I was like, okay. And he was like, what do you want to talk about? I was like, you first, man. And he goes, well, Christian, our company's been sold. They're firing everyone. You're going to get a fantastic severance package. Uh, you're going to get six months' pay, um, and you'll be leaving in two weeks. 
what do you want to say? I was like, nothing, man. I just thought your hair looked great, bro. Like, I just want to let you know your hair looks good. It was the day that I was going to quit. That's what God does. That's what God, I would have never known that. If I would have had to consider I'm leaving this career behind, I might not have done it, but I just listened and God took care of it. And I would have felt really stupid if I said no to the opportunity God wanted me to go to and I ended up losing my job anyways. When you listen to God and he tells you to do something, just do it. Don't make it complicated. Just say yes. He'll help you sort out the details. So I want to talk to you about the church building. And I want to show you how this worked in the church building, and then we're close. I know we're, we're going a little long today, but and I'm just encouraged. I'm on fire this morning. This is what you all get. When you laugh at my jokes, and you're just encouraging me to go longer. Um, when you all are all like super quiet, I'm like, let's wrap this thing up. So you all know we needed a new church building. We've been looking for more than a year for a church building. Um, because this room, when it gets full, especially with all the kids, it kind of feels a little cramped, right? Sometimes we could feel a little bit like sardines. Y'all remember Mission Sunday? We couldn't even get through those two doors because there were so many people here. And so we've been looking for a year for a new church building. And about a year ago, um, or about six months ago, Pastor John comes to me and he says, Hey, our church is growing. We need to use those two rooms for youth groups. Can you start looking for a new church building? So for six months, we looked for a new church building, and then Pastor John comes and says, we need to use these two rooms for youth group. We want to start this youth program. And then we really start looking, and a man and I really just grinded looking for a church building. We talked to probably 10 different real estate agents. We looked at 20 different properties. We talked to a bank about what kind of loan we could afford, and, and praise God, uh, we, we were given a, a, a approval for a $200,000 loan, and we were like, okay, this is what we can afford as a church, and we can do this, and we can do that. Uh, and there was a couple buildings that we seriously looked at. Uh, and one, God just closed the door. Just closed the door. Um, and then the other, uh, this, this was, uh, uh, we, we looked at a few uh, just down here that were out of our price range. And I began to get really frustrated because I really, really, really wanted to be in a new building. And it was difficult for me to hear God. And so like the person praying for a million dollars, Instead of listening to God, I was just like, well, God, you need to do this, and you need to move, and this is what needs to happen, and you need to make a way, and this, that, and the other thing. And I, I went on a drought for almost an entire year of not hearing God say anything about a church building. It was so frustrating to me. Finally, I prayed a very honest prayer. Lord, I am failing at listening to you right now. Would you please send someone else would you speak to them to speak into my life so I can hear what you want? You all know that God loves honest prayers. Right? We can't fake prayers and be like, oh, I'm going to pretend that I have faith, but I'm lying. One of Jesus' favorite prayers in scriptures was when a man said, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. The guy was saying, I know you can do it, but I don't think you're going to do it. Like, I believe, but, and he was saying, so help me. I prayed that prayer before. It's an honest prayer. God knows where we're at, and God honors those kinds of prayers. So the next day after I prayed that, Pastor Dick comes over about a completely different issue. We had some things going on, and, and we needed to come and, and pray with us and counsel us through some things that were, were going on with ministry life. They, it was not about a building at all, but they came over, Dick and Kim came over, and they're praying over us. And as he's praying over these situations, he just stops, and he starts praying for our church building, and he goes, Lord, I pray that CLC would be in a new building by December 25th this year. That was three months ago that he said that. He said, I pray they'll be in a new building by December 21st. And then God whispered to me for the first time in a year about the church building. God whispered to me, Christian, that's me, not Dick speaking. I want you to be in a church building by December 25th. And then I promptly stopped listening to God and said, okay. All right, December 25th, Lord, got it, no problem. And I started calling up more real estate agents and seeking after him. And, cause, well, y'all, I mean, you laugh, but I don't want God to look bad, okay? Right? I don't want him to look bad. God said, Is there, I told the church December 25th, I don't want him to look bad. Like, God needs my help proving his faithfulness or something. But seriously, that's what my thought was. And there's all these logistics with finding a church building, y'all. And some of y'all understand this. When you're looking for a church building, it's not like I could just find any old building. I've got to find one in the proper location, not too far away from anyone. 
It's got to be at least twice as big as we are now because we want room to grow. It needs to be handicap accessible. It needs to have good acoustic range so that people can hear. It needs to have parking, and, and we need to be able to afford it. We need to figure out, are we going to rent or are we going to buy? If we're going to rent, who's our landlord going to be? Is that someone I want to rent from, a, one of God's holy buildings? And, and if we're going to buy, what's our mortgage terms going to be? How long are we going to be chained down to this decision? We also have to ask, are the people going to like this church building or are they going to look at me like I'm crazy for, for buying this particular building or renting out that particular building? And then there is this incredible burden as a pastor that I was feeling with this decision. And the incredible burden was this. I don't want to make a decision that's not from God because then I'm moving a church into a building that God has not told us to move into. And I felt this incredible crushing weight of that. Lord, if this isn't from you, what, what happens if I make this decision? So three months ago, Dick says, December 25th. You need to be in there by December 25th. I announced it to the church, and I start looking. And then as the days go on, uh, I start making compromises. Because I'm like, we got to find something, and so maybe my standards are too high. And so we even looked at one that I was planning to put an offering on, and, and even Jay came down and looked at this place, and we were like, okay, it's not handicap accessible, and the parking's kind of terrible, but what can we do? And maybe we can, we can put in a door here, and we can dig out a, a ramp, and we can figure this out. And, and things were just kind of weird, but I was like, we got to do something. And as I was leaving, I was talking to Amanda, and I was planning on putting in an offer on this building, a low offer, but an offer. And I heard God just tell me, wait. He didn't tell me no. He said, just wait. The second time that he had talked to me about the church building. Very simple. That's how God speaks sometimes. Just wait. I said, all right, God, you got two weeks. All right? And I, said, I said, I had no problem. I was like, we can make them sweat a little bit. Like, they're not going to sell this place. That's just going to make our offer look better as it's been on the market for two more weeks. God says, wait. And so I'm freaking out still, and I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I'm, I'm at uh, uh, our, our pastor's lunch that we have every week. And Pastor Dick tells me, hey, I feel like God wants you to meet with Pastor Caleb Plum. I know some of y'all know Pastor Caleb Plum from Encounter Christian Fellowship. He says, I feel like God wants you to meet with Pastor Caleb Plum. And I'm like, great. I've seen his space. It's awesome. Is his building up for rent? What's going on? And he goes, no, 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 no. God didn't say anything about a building. Okay, just, I just want you to meet. God says he just wants you to spend time with Caleb. I said, okay. I said, all right. So I set up a meeting with Caleb, and I love the guy, and we hadn't talked in forever. Last time we talked was when we went golfing like two years ago, and, um, and, and I was like, hey, let's meet up. And so he's like, sure, let's meet on Tuesday. So we go to meet coffee on Tuesday, and I set aside in my heart, I'm not going to ask about a building. I'm not going to talk about it. We're not going to, that's not what this is about. Dick said it's not about a building. I'm going to honor that Dick heard from the Lord, and we're just going to talk. And so we're talking, and we're talking about all sorts of stuff and his church history and life and ministry and fellowship. And then he just stops, and he goes, hey, by the way, do you know so-and-so? And I was like, well, I think my wife knows her. And he goes, you need to call her. I was like, what do you mean I need to call her? And he goes, well, she's meeting about a church building, and I know that you've been looking for one. And they need a church to fill this space. And by the way, they're meeting tomorrow morning, so you should probably call her right now. And I was like, oh, okay. So I call her up, and she's like, yeah, we need a church to put in this space. And, and the guy who, who owns the space really wants it to be used to glorify God, and it would be great. And Encounter turned us down. So would you come and look at it on Tuesday morning? And I said, sure. So I go on Tuesday morning. And Christina's heart, this is Christina Hernandez who did this, if you all know Christina Hernandez from Sister Life, uh, House of Hope, River of Life. And, and Christina's heart was the same as my heart as if we had bought a church building. She wanted to fill this space with as many ministries as possible. She had not as many churches, just one church, just one church for Sundays and Wednesdays. But during the week, other ministries, Sister Life, House of Hope, all of these other ministries that could, could use, come rest ministries that could use the space and the offices and the things. She wanted to fill it for the glory of God. And so she had invited a bunch of ministries that I didn't know about. She invited these ministries. And God always gives miraculous confirmations when he's working. I show up to this meeting, and there's six ministries there, and I personally know five of them. And I had no idea this ministry was, 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 this meeting was happening. One of them was Pastor Dick. And I was like, bro, you didn't want to tell me about this meeting? Like, and he was like, oh, I didn't even think about it. Like, they want to put a church in here? One of them was Pam, y'all. Pam was there, okay? And I was like, I was like, Pam, hello. Like, call a guy. 
Like, but God didn't want it to look fleshly. God didn't want it to look like I had done anything. So we get to this space. The space is four times bigger. It's handicap accessible. It's beautiful. We love the guy who's in charge of the space. Their heart's the same as our heart. It's in a fantastic, fantastic location, and we can afford it. And I realize that God has done something in less than 24 hours that I could do trying my hardest for a whole year. God did it in less than 24 hours. That's what listening to God looks like. The final confirmation, I believe, came from, and this is, you got you to gotta be kind of open-minded when it comes to confirmation. Y'all, Yo, you understand that we believe that there is a God who is in control of all the universe, right? And, and that this God created everything, that he knew you and me before we were in the womb, and that he's all-knowing. When you really come to that realization that this is what we believe, you understand that coincidences aren't coincidences. Because right. God is in control, and he knows. So here's the, the last coincidence that where I was like, okay, this has to be from God. Amanda is spending time in God's holy land, the holy temple called Chick-fil-A. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of it before. And she is so lonely. And she is, some of y'all probably got this text. She started texting people, can you come meet me at Chick-fil-A? Can you come, I want you to spend time with me at Chick-fil-A. Everybody turned her down. They had other stuff to do. It's fine. You know, stuff happens. And she's texting me. I'm away doing something else. And she's texting me. No one can come. Everyone's turning me down. What's going on? And then who walks in but the landlord of this building who Amanda knows his wife from another ministry. And she's able to spend time with him. The same day that we met about this building, I've never met these guys in my life before, but Amanda knows this woman and knows these people and knows their children. And Amanda's been looking for fellowship and they've all been turning her down. And here their family comes, walks in and sits with Amanda and gives her the fellowship. She's never run into them in public in her, in, in her entire stay here in Cedar Rapids, never run into them in public. The day that we meet for the building, she runs into them. And she tells me, and I'm like, that's got to be God. That's got to be God confirming that this is him. So I wanted to share that testimony because I wanted you all to know that I did not find a new church building for the church. I didn't do it. I didn't call the real estate agent. I didn't find the right person. It was completely God. 100% God. Just like this building. Just like our house when we moved here. God has always operated this way for us. It's very frustrating to me because I'm not in control and I like to be in control of things and it's sometimes very terrifying. But God spoke. We listened and that's why we're moving in. I hope that God, that, that, that this church, that the individual and the families of this church are able to hear God, are able to listen to Him and are able to follow Him. It's a simple process. Now I want to close with one more thing. I talked about this question that is a crushing burden as a pastor, and many pastors have this problem. This question of, what if I'm doing something that's not of God? What if I'm making a decision that's not of God? When I was studying for this message, God showed me that that's a red flag that I'm not listening to him. I should never feel burdened by that question. Because if I was listening to him and following him and seeing the miraculous confirmations, then it would not be difficult to say, is this of God or not? There would be no burden on that question. See, God has confirmed this new building so many times, and it's all of him and not from me, that if someone tried to say it was not from God, I would look at them like they were crazy because of all of the things that God has done. If you feel burdened by the question, is this decision I'm making from God or not, then I would urge you to take a step back and start listening more to him and looking for those miraculous confirmations. If you're still having hang-ups with this, y'all, I, I want you to, to find somebody to pray with them, to talk with them. And, and just, man, start, write down what you think God's saying. Go to your disciple and say, I think God's saying this. What do you think? And finally, please listen to the counsel of others, okay? Listen to the counsel of others. If you think God is telling you something and you bring it to five or six godly people who you trust and they all say the same thing that he's not telling you that, okay, do not be so proud that you think that you're the only one who hears from God. If, if everybody else is saying no, listen. I do it with other pastors all the time. I call them up and sometimes they're like, no, bro, God's not saying that. And then I'm like, oh. And I have to say, who do I trust more? 
Do I trust myself that's got flesh, that's got something vested in this situation? Or would I trust these other men and women of God who are, who, who are not vested in the situation, who are just as capable of listening to God? So I want to encourage you in that as well. Would you all join with me in praying as we close out? Lord, I want to be a church that follows after your path and not our own. Your word says there is a path that seems right unto men, a way that seems right unto men, and that that way leads to destruction. I don't want to follow my own way, Lord. I want to follow you. I want to follow your way. Even if it doesn't seem right to me, the way that seems right to me leads to destruction. I want to follow your way. Lord, I pray that this would be a church that listens to you, a church that finds quiet time to just stop and to wait. Lord, what are you whispering to us today? Lord, you are so good. We honor you today as the great leader that you are, that you would lead the way because we've not gone this way before. And so we're following you. We're trusting you. Lord, lead the way. And Father, I just want to thank you for being so merciful to miraculously confirm when you're, when, when you're leading and we're following. Father, help us to see those miracles. Lord, as a church, let us listen to you. As families, let us listen to you. As individual followers of Jesus Christ, let us listen to you. Help us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.